ahead and formally introduce our speaker for today. <clears throat> so today we have the great Amir Botros, who is a senior uh, structural and bridge engineer at Stantec. Um, he has more than 12 years of academic and professional experience in the civil engineering uh, industry with a particular emphasis on concrete structures and bridges. He is skilled in finite element analysis, computer-aided design, and earthquake engineering. He has a doctor of philosophy focused on structural engineering with, uh, I'm sorry, from North Carolina State University. And, um, and he's a member of the Precast Pre-Stress Concrete Institute for many years and has participated in many of the PCI research projects. He is the recipient of the 2018 TY Lin Award for his outstanding research on precess concrete, <clears throat> thin stemmed members, uh, dapped ends. So without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and give you, Amir, the control so you can share your screen. Well, thank you, Luciana. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction. No, nope. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, uh, just want to say uh, it's it's always a pleasure to be here with Midas Group, and uh, I hope everyone attending is uh, safe and enjoying the end of year vacations or holidays. Um, so uh, this session. Uh, Today is uh, basically a, cont a continuation of the previous session that we had in October 19, 29, I'm sorry, October 29. And uh, this first session was uh, about employing the staged construction analysis uh, for precast, pretensioned concrete girder bridges. So we had two examples on this session uh, introducing the precast, pretensioned concrete girders, uh, which is a very I, I call it the everyday bridges that we deal with is uh, the pretensioned concrete girder bridges. And we had an example using the plate elements for modeling the deck, and the other one was using the grillage method, which assumes or uses the beam elements for uh, the longitudinal elements and the transverse elements. Uh, so basically today, I uh, want to dedicate this session more towards complex types of bridges. Um, how to employ the phased construction analysis in uh, complex types. And I have two examples uh, today in this under this subject. So one of them is a post-tensioned um, box girder segmental bridge. That is one of them. And you can see this is the model that I'm showing on the screen uh, for this segmental bridge. And the other uh, example is a curved steel plate girder bridge. So this bridge is consisting of two steel plate girders and it has a curved alignment, uh, as you can see on the screen. Those, to me, uh, represent complex level uh, for bridges, especially the steel ones, because it has too many details and the curvature or the curved alignment is one challenge and the continuity is another challenge. Uh, Basically, I'm going to start first today with this one, with the segmental one, and I hope the time permits to go to the other one as well and cover it, but we will see how it goes. So let's start with the uh, post-tension segmental one. And uh, just to uh, introduce to you the bridge geometry and the type of the bridge first, just to give you some information for the audience about this bridge. So. This bridge is constructed using uh, what we call the free cantilever method, and it's also known as the balanced cantilever method. So some of you might be familiar with this uh, type of construction. So we have the pier constructed in the middle, and then the bridge comes in the form of segments, and those segments are like parts or pieces that can be assembled together uh, to uh, get the bridge in construction, so this is how this thing works. Uh, those segments can be cast in place segments, concrete segments, or can be precast ones. It depends on the uh, method that's uh, chosen for construction, and uh, too many factors come into play when we select uh, whether to use the cast in place or the segment or the precast construction for these types of bridges. Um, I'm here using one of Midas models, by the way, uh, to present this topic because I have um, investigated this model uh, thoroughly and 
I see that it's a good example and a simple example to kind of simplify the problem because those types of bridges are really complex and I didn't want to go to one that has complexities in the geometries or uh, complexity in, in the pre-stressing. I just wanted to use this one just to convey the idea of employing the phase construction analysis in these types of bridges. So let me just start first going on the bridge data. That's the bridge that we are dealing with. It's consisting of three spans, like you can see. Usually those bridges are uh, used when whenever you, you are crossing over a river or a creek or a waterway. And sometimes you can be crossing over a big uh, water stream, like a branch coming from sea or something. Uh, this is where those types of bridges we prefer them and basically those allow you to have a big span in the middle like you can see this is here in a metric unit so this is 130 meters span uh, which is like almost you can see 390 or 400 feet in u.s units and this allows for a big navigational channel so the ships or any traffic that's uh, going underneath it can still pass without any hazards of hitting the piers or having a pier collision and the, this also type of construction when we employ the segmental construction and the bridge comes into segments that are lifted and installed post-tensioned or basically building the formwork for each segment casting it and post-tensioning the cables this works nicely in these types of bridges the segmental construction because you are not able here to have some kind of traditional shoring or false work or something that you can put inside the waterway and build your form on top of it and cast the bridges like what we do in conventional bridges that are with smaller spans and running on the ground so that's why this type of bridge it is really it works nicely to have this type of construction when we have this segmental construction the you can see here, uh, I'm just choosing a bridge that has only three spans. The end spans are 85 meters. The inner one is 130 meters. Keep an eye on the ratio between this end span and the middle one, because this ratio, you need to be at least 60% or more to make sure that you don't get uplift uh, reactions at the end abutment here under dead loads. And this is something that can be achieved uh, at the final stage when on all the bridges assembled you want to make sure that this span never be less than 60 percent than the middle the middle one or the largest you see the cross sections for uh, this type of bridge is usually a box girder section which is a very efficient section in terms of resisting all type of internal actions moments shears and even torsional effects and you can see we have uh, the section is varying in depth from the mid span or the middle of the bridge all the way to the end or the support you can see the depth increases significantly here at the end and this is something that we do intentionally because the way uh, this bridge is constructed uh, it is assuming a cantilever a double cantilever construction all the way under dead load so you can imagine the huge negative moment that you end up with at the pier here which really needs a big, stiff, strong section to resist it, as compared to the positive moment at mid-span, which is uh, usually much less than the negative moment. That's why we can have a small section at mid-span here. This is coming basically or primarily from the way how we construct those bridges, because we are employing this uh, segmental construction using the frequent lever method. So we are having a statical system that uh, performs as a double cantilever under all the construction stages and under dead load. And uh, you can imagine after all the segments are assembled at the end, when the uh, creep effect starts to take place and the shrinkage, those are the long term effects. This is where you start to build some positive moment at mid span here from the dead load. So this usually happens later on, and this positive moment is very small as compared to the negative moment that's generated here during construction. This photo here is showing you, uh, or image, is showing you the segments of the bridge, how, how many segments do we have, and basically this example here is having 12. So this middle portion here, we have the pier, and this portion of the cap is called the pier table zone. That's usually a solid uh, zone in, in the bridges, and this is all constructed together. The pier and the cap here is usually constructed as one piece that's casted all together 
and then we start assembling or putting the segments here, either picking them up from a barge or ship or something if they are precast, or uh, having the crane installed here and building up the form and putting the reinforcement and the ducts for the pre-stressing, and then basically casting the concrete in situ uh, or in place. And after the concrete hardens to the designated strengths, you can start post-tensioning the cables uh, here, and that's where you start to assemble this segment and then go to the next one and so on and so forth. You can see we have 12 segments on each side, and basically those segments are numbered the way they are constructed. So basically the ones in number one, this means that those goes in stage number one, like those two are casted in stage number one, and then we move to the other two casted in stage number two and so on so forth. There are too many ways to construct those bridges, honestly. This is one of the ways that I will call this the ideal way to construct it. If you have the two segments that are casted at the same time simultaneously together, because if you have it this way, this means that you don't have an unbalanced moment that's going to be transferred from the superstructure to the pier. So whenever you try to eliminate this unbalanced moment, this works better for construction because it reduces the internal forces or the actions on the pier during construction. But to do this, there is a cost that needs to be associated, which is basically having a form traveler on each end or at each end at the same time. So you can form up the work for each segment at the same time, put the reinforcement in and post tension ducts in and basically casting the concrete at the same time, uh, hopefully, and ending up with tensioning the cables. So to do this, this means that you have form traveler at each side working at the same time. And in a bridge like this, it's going to be even better if you can construct two piers at the same time. So this means that you have four form travelers, two at each pier to construct the segments in the meantime or simultaneously at the same time. Those conditions are not usually the case when we get to construct those segmental bridges. So sometimes you can have one form traveler. So you basically construct the segment at one end and then you switch to the other end to construct the other segment. So this creates an unbalanced moment. Uh, and this unbalanced moment is basically the difference between the bending moment from these two arms. And this difference is transferred to the pier. So the pier needs to be designed or checked to take this moment during construction. Some uh, designers uh, prefer to have uh, like cast one half of a segment in the very first beginning or the very first stage and then they start to go one full segment on each side after that so this way they can reduce the unbalanced moment to uh, one half the segment only so that's the only the moment that's transferred to the pier. This helps with the construction. But anyway, the case that we have here, we are constructing the two segments at the same time, which really eliminates the uh, unbalanced moment that is transferred from the weights of the concrete, at least. This is also giving you an idea how the post-tensioned cables look like for this bridge. And you can imagine, of course, usually we have to have the pre-stressing tendons to follow the bending moment shape. Uh, so we expect on the double cantilever, all time during construction having a huge significant negative moment here. And that's why we expect to have all the tendons at the top. And basically the way this is put inside the section, uh, we usually have the tendons put in the top slab or at least the bridges that I really participated in were built this way. We have all the tendons in the top slab because that is the location where you have a concrete member and you can have your strands placed inside it and make sure when you anchor those strands, you can pull against the member or the slab so the slab can take the forces during the pre-stressing. Um, you can see here all the tendons are placed at the top and those ones shown on the bottom are the ones in the locations for the positive moment sections, which are basically those ones here at the end, at the very end of the bridge, or the ones at mid-span. This is the center line of the bridge, by the way. So here, so those are the tendons that are uh, post-tensioned after we cast all the thing with the key segments and the bridge starts to work as a continuous beam. This is where we start post-tensioning those pre-stressing strains to make sure that we have enough resistance for the positive moment that's going to be generated after construction and from all superimposed dead loads and live loads and all the other loads 
uh, generated later on on the bridge. You see also here the tendons, we have uh, short ones here and this becomes longer and longer and basically this happens because every time you add segments the bridge length increases so this means that the tendons that are used to post tension the far segments starts to kick in so that's why you expect to have this gradation in in the length of the tendons it's coming from shorter one and longer and longer and so forth uh, this section here you have to expect to have all the tendons performing uh, at this section because this is a section that has the maximum negative moment and when the moment reduces as you go away from the pier this is where you expect to cut your reinforcement or the pre-stressing strands uh, pre-stressing tendons and this kind of curtailment thing that you are seeing in the tension uh, tendons or in the pre-stressing tendons follows the shape of the bending point. You can see the short ones, we usually tension them from one side and anchor them from the other side. So this is pulling them from one end only. And this makes sense because the short ones, you don't experience much of frictional losses uh, during tensioning them. That's why you can tension them from one end. But when they start to be longer like this, uh, you need to re really to have a live end at each uh, face of segment and pull from both ends to reduce the friction losses as much as you can. So this is just an idea how the uh, bridge look like, the geometry, uh, of course, the loads and um, the material properties here uh, are shown. <coughs> and uh, this is also here a diagram that shows you how this form traveler look like. So it is basically the traveler or the crane that is uh, hanging at the tip of the bridge or the tip of the cantilever and this crane by itself has a weight and of course the force is usually eccentric from the end node of the bridge so this means that this weight is transferred at the end moon at the end or the tip of the cantilever using the concentrated force and the concentrated moment uh, based on, on this configuration and also keep in mind when you start forming up the segment here placing the reinforcement the tendons and casting the concrete you are adding additional weights here from the form work and then later on the weight of the fresh concrete or the wet concrete itself kicks in so all those are kind of concentrated loads applied at the very end or the tip of the cantilever and those also generates moments at the pier here or at the negative moment section here this usually happens or this effect even becomes greater when you proceed with the construction to further segments like for example going five six every time those loads are hanging at the very tip of the cantilever so you can imagine the effect of the internal force at the negative moment section here is even more magnified when you proceed further with the construction at the two sides or the two uh, sides of the pier I think this serves as a good presentation for the bridge geometry and we get an idea how the bridge segments look like and how they are constructed. Uh, so just to get you an idea also about the uh, phases of construction that we are looking for for this model and this model has 16 total construction stages here that I'm going to be showing you and the first one starts when you have the pier and the, and the tabletop or the pier and the pier table constructed monolithically together and casted together and then you install the form travelers at the ends here you see we have four form travelers assumed here and then you start adding segments on both on the two ends at the same time simultaneously and then you proceed, then the form traveler moves to the next segment on either side, and then you construct those segments and then so forth. That's how it proceeds. So all stages from two to 13 look like this. It's just the cantilever getting longer and longer on both sides. Then at stage number 14, this is where we uh, construct the end uh, section of the bridge. And usually we have shores here because you can plug shorings here closer to the coast of the river or uh, the land or the ground you can still put shores and build the formwork here on the ground and basically cast the concrete for those end segments uh, from the ground like a traditional construction thing then you come at this at this stage beside constructing the end ones you start pouring what we call here as the key segment and this key segment is a segment that's joining between the tip of the cantilever coming from the free cantilever construction 
and the uh, end of the bridge that's constructed on the ground. Basically, you construct this key segment here, and then the following stage, you construct the one on the other end, so this way you are maintaining symmetry and trying to keep the response of the bridge as much as possible symmetric on both ends. And then later on, at the final stage, you come and cast the key segment at the middle, which joins the two uh, pieces together. And this concludes the construction stages at this point. Beyond this point, of course, um, you can expect all the moments coming from dead load will be negative moments here, as if it's a cantilever thing, or a, because it's a cantilever thing, actually. But as time goes uh, far, uh, creep and shrinkage effects are kicking in all the time. Creep means that the structure deforms or strains under sustained load. So we are not increasing the load, the load is the same. Dead load on the structure, and the structure keeps deforming and straining under this load. So this starts to build up positive movement at this section here under dead load. Even though this section used to be zero during construction at the tip, but now the weight of this segment and the creep effect starts building up uh, with time and this creates positive movement. And of course, after you put the superimposed dead load on the bridge and uh, the barriers and open the bridge to traffic, which means the live load kicks in, all those loads are acting on a continuous beam now. Uh, or a continuous structure, so you can imagine having positive wounds coming from all those load effects. So let's jump to the model and go over very quickly. So the purpose of this presentation is, <coughs> sorry, the purpose of this presentation is to focus more on construction stages, so I'm not worrying about definitions related to materials and sections, but I just want to go very quickly on a few things that are uh, features related or associated with this model. So first thing, of course, you will have to build your geometry and this is a very, honestly, one of the easiest bridges to build the geometry for. It's just a straight beam element from the very beginning to the very end to represent the superstructure and you have the piers here. Also, we do have uh, the elastic links and those are just rigid links here connecting between the superstructure and the piers. Those are representing the depth of the beam of the girder here. And those needs to be rigid because this structure needs to be stable during construction. So you wanna make sure that this is a monolithic connection. In other words, the pier and the cap are acting together like one frame and basically this is a fixed connection, completely fixed. So building this, of course, uh, that's also another thing that I wanted to highlight. In Midas has a nice, powerful wizard here that you can use, and it's design, designated or designed uh, basically for building the uh, segmental, this type of bridges that utilize the free cantilever method and the segmental bridges. So you can go over the tabs and build everything from inside the wizard, define tendons, define sections, everything here. Uh, this is one way to do it. But if you are not familiar with the wizard, you can also build the entire geometry from outside, like any regular model that you are building for a bridge, just creating the nodes, the frame elements, and finding material sections and making all the assignments and the load cases defined here. So, of course, we'll define the materials. We have two materials in this model. This is a metric unit model, so it's using the, the international units. So we have the three materials, the two concretes, one for the superstructure, which is much higher than the substructure. That's what we expect uh, because of the post-tensioning. So we need higher strength here for higher allowable limits. And the tendon is using the steel material. This is time-dependent properties, and this is something very important in this type of construction how to count for the effects coming from creep, shrinkage, or those long-term effects, and also the concrete compressive strength gain with time, like how the concrete gains the compressive strength with time. All those uh, properties, it's very important to define them inside the model to make sure uh, whenever you go into the construction stages and start plugging in times and durations for every step and for every uh, installation that the, the, the uh, software takes into consideration effects or calculates automatically the effects coming from creep, shrinkage, and uh, how much strength gain are we having on each stage or each duration. I'm going to 
uh, highlight this later on in the model, but just wanted to jump to something different now. So basically, you will have your definitions for materials, sections, and the time-dependent materials. And that's the piece that I wanted to highlight. It's basically how to define this tapered section here or the variation in the depth of the section. So this is a nice feature inside Midas and I wanted to highlight it on a very simple model here, this model. Uh, just I drew it very quickly with a single frame element. Let's say that we are um, defining this. We are having a tapered section. And just for simplicity, I'm going to assume it's a rectangular section and we are going from a 5 by 5 section to a height 8 by 5 section for example so we define a tapered section like this and once you define it it's going to be assigned automatically to all the frames you can see each frame varies from 5 to 8 here so this doesn't give you the variation that you are looking for at this stage and here uh, comes the nice feature inside Midas, it's called tapered group. Basically, when you pick on this one, you just want to uh, show here the element numbers, just to get an idea how those numbers are. It's very important to number all your elements and make sure we have here 50 elements and each element is two feet. So this is a hundred feet long element. And basically there is nice features inside Midas that you can renumber the elements if you need to. For example, if you hit on this one, pick all the elements, you can renumber all the elements from one to whatever, or you will start with, from, let's say, 100 to 150, or whatever you choose. But numbering the elements is very essential when you get to this definition of the tapered section definition. So we go again, return to this one to define the tapered group, and we call it a variable or whatever. And then we write here the number of the elements that we have. So we are picking elements number 1 to 50, uh, this group, and we are adding this. So once you add it, this means that all those elements are considered as one group that is varying the section from 5 feet depth to 8 feet depth. So this gets you the taper section that you are looking for. And if you end the definition up to here, it's going to be treated as a tapered section group, and it's just showing you the section that's varying from 5 to 8, the tapered section that I defined earlier. But there is also another nice feature here that you can do if you are interested to see the sections in between and how Midas is calculating the properties for those sections. You can always, if you go to this definition again and you choose this option to convert to taper sections and then you hit OK, this is going to automatically create all 50 sections on this element for you and you can pick on any one of them and <clears throat> hit properties and look at exactly what height are we using at this level and basically you can also check the properties if you need to um, from here from this one show you area inertia shear areas uh, section models uh, centroid everything so Having this nice feature inside uh, Midas helps us definitely when we define those types of sections. Uh, the pre-stressed sections definitions go from here. You can always define it. We have a tab here, or Midas has a tab that has the pre-stressed sections, and you can select whatever the number of cells is, define all the uh, properties. I'm sorry, I'm just... I'm, I'm picking the wrong one. That's the pre-stress section. You can pick whatever the section configuration is going to be and name it and basically apply all the definitions for all the dimensions that are needed to define the section. And basically, if you show calculation results, this gives you all the properties of the section, which are very important for those statically indeterminate structures. And it shows you here a preview of the section, how it looks like as well. So that's how we define the two sections, the sec section at mid span and the section at the support. You can see here this deeper one. <coughs> and then later on, we defined a tapered section that is going from the mid span section to the uh, support section that's in another definition. And what we did is basically picking up the elements, numbering them and calling them or grouping them in, un, uh, under the tapered group and varying this from uh, the mid-span section to the support section and then converting this to see all the different sections with their property definitions. So this is really one of the powerful uh, tools inside Midas to be able to calculate this, all these elements 
uh, automatically. This was not included in the past. It, it was really difficult, even in other software packages, when you cannot have a feature like this and you sit down, imagine that you divide the element into smaller elements and pick definition or define each frame element with a section at the beginning and section at the end and all the intermediate sections you have to calculate the properties for. It was really a difficult thing. You can see the degree of complexity in a model like this. And even if we have more spans and this is a larger bridge, you can end up with like 200, 300 sections done the same way. Then basically you define, uh, so before going to the construction stages, you need to complete all definitions for the bridge, including materials, including the time dependent properties, which I will go on shortly, or the boundary conditions for the bridge. For the boundary conditions here, uh, we, we, that's a typical thing that we do, that we define the ends of the piers at the bottom here to be fully fixed support. And uh, this is basically because of the big foundation, pile cap foundation and piles or drill shafts that are used on those uh, bridges. So this is providing full fixation here. And the end supports, which are at the two ends here, which we assume as a roller support that permits movement or translation in the longitudinal direction. So this way the bridge can expand and contract under thermal effects uh, with how it should be. And finally, those elastic link definitions. So if you pick on those, this represents all the rigid links that are connecting the superstructure to the pier uh, or the rigid link connecting it to the end support here. All the loads, you need to define all the loads on the bridge at once before going to uh, construction stages. So the self-weight, you can imagine the pre-stressing loads and uh, basically all the form traveler loads. I just want to display this to show you how much this basically is a definition at every single node. You want to define at every single node the concentrated load and concentrated movement that are acting on the load. Of course, those are not acting at the same time. This is just the definition done first on the base model, like before going to the construction stage. You want to make sure that you include all the loads on the model first as static loads. And then later on, when you go to the construction stage, like we, we will see shortly, this is where you start to activate each one of those loads in the designated construction stage. So the same thing goes for the form traveler and the wet concrete loads. <coughs> wet concrete means this is the weight of the concrete while the concrete is still fresh inside the formwork before it hardens. <coughs> this load acts at the end <coughs> of the cantilever and uh, when you move from one segment to the other, this load of course is, is uh, included already when the segment hardens it, it becomes hardened concrete so you can go to the other one that's under construction and when it's activated or, or uh, it starts to harden this this weight is going to be removed later on in the uh, uh, in the consecutive uh, stage and uh, some erection loads and other loads so you have to define all the loads here and you can imagine also the pre-stressing the pre-stressing is something that you need to define on the entire bridge and you can imagine we have 122 tendons inside this bridge because that includes all the tendons <clears throat> that i showed you earlier here for the two piers and the mid span section and the end sections so that's quite a huge amount of pre-stressing tendons that you need to define and definition of the tendons is something that I also want to, um, <clears throat> to highlight here because it is one of the nice uh, uh, features inside Midas that you can, I'm just taking a moment to show uh, the pre-stress load here and the cable itself. Yes, a tendon profile point. So this is going to display to you the tendons <clears throat> here. This is an example of, of, of the tendons and you can see if you step on any one of those just to get an idea how we... So here, because I'm stepping on construction stage one, it's only displaying for me the tendons that apply to this stage, which are the tendons in the two uh, on the peer tables or the first very first peer table segments here. So we have eight tendons. And if you press on this one, it's going to show you how Midas defines the profile. So 
it is basically linked to the frame elements that it is associated with. So showing the frame elements here, the element numbers, you can see the numbers from 19 to 23. So those are the elements that you define first, which means the tendon profile that you are defining is related to those elements. And basically you start the cable from X equal to zero to 14, which is the length of the cable. So those two, the numbers are basically related to the cable. It's the start of the cable, the end of the cable, and you can have as many uh, stations in between, depending on the nodes, how you discretize or how you divided your frame elements or the beam elements here. So, and then basically you have a Y axis ordinate and Z ordinate. The Y ordinate uh, represents the location of the profile cable uh, or the location of the pre-stressed cable in plan view and Z represent its location in the vertical direction or in the depth direction. <clears throat> and you can see it's a, one good feature inside Midas. You can define everything at Y equal to zero, which is basically coinciding on the beam element or the frame element here. And then later on, you can use this option here for an offset, which means this tendon that's highlighted here, the orange one, is offset 3.65 meters from the center or from the frame. So it's an easy way, so you don't bother about Y ordinate, you just give an offset at the end. For the Z ordinate, this is basically the distance from uh, the uh, insertion point of the, of the section all the way to the tendon. So this means that the tendon is 30 centimeters or 0.3 meter below the insertion point of the uh, section. And for you to get the insertion point or to understand it, that's how the frame is defined. So it's inserted at the top center here. That's the beam element location. So you see this tendon is 0.3 meter away from, in the vertical direction, away from this node. And then you can always play with the coordinates to get the profile, whatever profile of tendon that you are dealing with. So that's how you define the tendon in a plan view and in a elevation view or vertical view. That's one of the nice features to define it. Also, you have uh, options that you can copy tendons and do, uh, while defining this, you can always copy tendons from each other. So this uh, makes it easier whenever you uh, get to define multiple tendons that have uh, uh, very close profiles or making just few tweaks to get all the tendon definition. Okay, so let's jump now into the construction stages. I think we are ready for that finally. And we can, um, go here on this one and see how the construction stages work. So basically, all our definitions in the main model from materials, sections, uh, boundary conditions, pre-stressing effect and loads are uh, used for a static model or a model without construction stages. Construction stages deal only with groups, group definitions, which means uh, Whatever elements I want to have them activated in a certain stage, those elements need to be defined first in a group. So that's what we call structural group. So this means that I need to divide my structure into the groups, uh, and those groups definition need to follow exactly the staging definition, which means, for example, segment 1-1 and 1 uh, and 2-1, those segments include the segments that will be generated in construction stage number one. When we go to construction stage number two, this is the second digit here. So this way of naming the segments make it easier whenever you redefine them inside the construction stages. So the second number indicates the phase number or the stage number. <clears throat> so defining all the structure in structure groups, every support definition that you did in the model here, including the uh, real supports or the fixed supports, let me go back to this. All those six support definitions, all the elastic links need to be defined into groups. And this is what we call as boundary group. This way you can activate or deactivate any boundary group during the stages easily. Load group is all the loads that you defined, including the pre-stressing effect, because the pre-stressing effect at the end of the day is a group, is a load group. And the tendons also need to be defined into the tendon groups. So that's the first step that you need to have ready before you jump into your construction stages. Construction stages is very simple. It's just the, uh, the idea of dealing with those three elements in the model. What element is going to be activated or deactivated in the group? 
what boundary condition is going to be activated or deactivated in the group, what load is going to be activated or deactivated in the group. Uh, sometimes we have a stage that we deactivate a load and activate another load in the same stage. That happens a lot, and you will see that shortly. It's just about this definition, that's all. And that's why we define here the whole, uh, all the groups at the beginning. Yeah, we define here the, the groups, all the groups at the beginning. I just uh, maybe missed to show you something here. Whenever you step on any group, this is going to show you, to highlight in red, the elements that are defined in this group. That's a very nice feature, so you can always make a check on yourself, like this is peer number one, it includes those two peers. And correspondingly on the second peer, peer number two includes the two peers. Group number one is the tabletop here. Group number two here is the tabletop on the other side. For example, segment one, one is, are those two segments which are constructed in the first stage. Segment one, two, the other two segments, one, three, all the segments up to stage number 12, which is the last one where we have the double cantilever statical system. So that's how we define it. And, and the same thing goes to the other peer. This is the first two segments, the second two segments, third, and so on, so forth, up to segment number 12 at the end here. Even the ends of the bridge that are constructed on shoring are even put into groups so we can acti activate them in the designated construction stage for that and we jump here to construction stage number one activate the peer and the tabletop in this stage and of course on the two peers so that's why we activated all those four groups and basically the boundary conditions you have to fix the peer at the bottom to be stable and you have the rigid links connecting the tabletop to the uh, peer and the loads, you want to make sure that you include the self-weight. Self-weight is a load case that calculates the weight, the own weight of all the elements that have a material and the section definition. This only needs to be included one time in the first stage of the bridge. And then later on, when you move to next stages, you don't need to activate it because it's automatically there. It's auto automatically included there anything activated any element activated in any stage that has a material and the section definition you will have the self-weight calculated for it in this stage and all the coming stages so what i did here is the first the very first stage we want to activate those two load groups those two load groups represent the form traveler and the weight of the fresh concrete because basically when we go to construction stage number one here This one here, I want to have a form traveler that's active here. And basically, we are forming up the segments here, putting the reinforcement and casting concrete. So we want to have the weight of the fresh concrete uh, that is going to be included in there. And you will see also clearly here that those are activated on the first day of construction. And this is activated on the seventh day because there is, should be a one week period when you start putting on the form traveler on the bridge and then building the formwork and the reinforcement cage and the tendons and ducts, put, putting in the ducts inside and then for, uh, pouring the concrete in. So the weight of the fresh concrete kicks in at day seven. And the reason I'm stressing on this definition because this day's definition uh, will make a difference when you get into creep effects and shrinkage effects, which uh, is associated with time. You will also see, in order to be able to break in the stages, like define this load at a particular day and this load kicks in, in another day, you want to have a step that is defined here. So you want to add step and make sure the step is at seven days. And you can add uh, as much steps as you want, as needed, uh, based on how you proceed with the construction and how the loads kick in in every stage. So this is basically about construction stage number one, just in summary, activating the peer groups and the peer table gr groups, then activating the boundary conditions uh, uh, at the bottom of the peer and the rigid links, and then activating the loads, including the self-weight for all the items uh, that I have sections materials in, the form traveler and the weight of the fresh concrete that kicks in in a week. Those two groups, by the way, are the tendon groups, which represent 
what tendons are pulled or what tendons are active in the stitch, like what pre-stressing effect is included in the stitch. So those are the two uh, cables that are included in this stitch. <clears throat> and a nice feature by Midas also is when you go to that stage here displayed, you will see all the elements active here, so you can check yourself. Those are the peers, tabletop, the tendons that are active in this group are also shown. And I want to make sure just to, to order to see the loads, you want to activate this load, you want to activate the pre-stressing load. And uh, you also want to activate the profile for the tendons. So this way you can check everything. You see the form traveler load and moment and the weight of the fre uh, fresh concrete and the elements activated and also the uh, pre-stressing tendons activated and the supports activated as well. And the rigid link, of course. <clears throat> so that is stage number one. And then we go to stage number two, the basic difference from one to two is this thing here. Stage number two, I'm going to add two additional segments, which makes sense because now I'm proceeding with, I finished the tabletop and casted those two segments. So those two segments are going to kick in this one and the other one. So those two segments need to be activated. Nothing in the boundary condition because the system is stable as it is. And finally for the load, it is, this thing needs to be deactivated because this is the form traveler and the weight of the fresh concrete of the previous segment, which is now active and hardened already on the structure, is installed and hardened. So you want to activate the previous load and move it to the new location, which is the very tip of the cantilever. So the tip of the cantilever is moving on the stages as you go. You want to make sure that you activate it from the previous step and move it to the new step and add the new pre-stressing tendons that are activated in this stage as well. So that basically gets you to construction stage number two. And then three, the same thing, the same methodology, four, five, all the way up to 12, which is the uh, last stage before the can for the cantilever or the double cantilever. And then you get to stage number 13, where you add the end portions of the bridge. So now the, the end pieces are also added in, <clears throat> I'm sorry, not 13, it should be 14, where the end uh, portions of the bridge are added in and the key segments are casted. And then 15, uh, adding the key segment on the other side, and then 16, finally adding the key segment in the middle, which concludes the construction of the bridge. And also in 16, we have added the superimposed dead load. So you can always see any loads that are added. You wanna just make sure that it's in view before you can see it. So this distributed load repres represents the superimposed dead load on the bridge that is activated in this stage. So just wanna jump quickly on the uh, results for this model. What do we expect to see uh, results from this balanced cantilever model? So. Let me just run the analysis very quick and go quickly on the results. Yeah. I'm sorry guys, so just before jumping to the uh, analysis, you wanna make sure you have some uh, uh, features here that are checked in. You wanna make sure that you are uh, doing this with a non-linear analysis. And you want to make sure that you include the time dependent effect, which is the cape and shrinkage effects. Also, the uh, this um, uh, uh, option for the initial tangent displacement for erected structures, make sure that whenever uh, that structure deforms in a particular stage and you move to the next stage, you are using the deformed shape for that structure before you jump to the next stage. So it's an accumulative. Uh, stage thing and also the analysis needs to be an accumulative stage which means that you accumulatively build each stage on the previous deformed shape and forces and internal forces and everything on the previous stage and we want to also make sure that you produce results uh, for every stage that's that's another thing that is important to check and then you jump into after we have all those settings correct there, you can jump to displaying the results. 
Of course, these types of structures, the primary thing that you want to check is the stresses in the top and the bottom fibers of the section at every single stage. That's very important. And in the pier as well, because the pier might carry an unbalanced moment that varies uh, from stage to the other. So you want to make sure the pier is okay in all stages. And also the bottom and the top stresses uh, inside the girder are also okay. And you also want to, you can look at bending moments, shear forces, axial forces. You can also monitor displacements or deformations. You can also look at the camber control, which is a very important item in these types of uh, uh, models or complex models that involve in uh, time-dependent properties, creep effects, shrinkage effects, uh, all those types of uh, elements. Should be relatively fast. I mean, it really doesn't take time. Models like this in the past used to take hours and hours to run. So that's also another strong feature about it. And uh, whenever you go and display construction stage, that's going to show you all the elements in this stage. If you wanna, if you are interested to look at the results, let's say for example, if I want to see the bending moments, I want to make sure that I'm picking the results here and what uh, load type or what case that I'm displaying the moment for. So am I, am I displaying it for all dead loads on the structure or the pre-stressing effect or the creep or the shrinkage or the summation of everything? Summation includes all those effects together, all together. Uh, by the way, this dead load effect lumps all loads uh, applied on the structure, including the self-weight and also the form traveler load and the wet concrete load. All, all those loads are lumped together inside this load case. Uh, there is an option inside MIDAS here in the construction stage that you can even do if, if needed. If you are interested to look at, let's say, the internal forces generated from the um, uh, form traveler by itself, you can easily do that uh, it's not showing in here because I already ran the model, but if, if it's not running, it's going to show you all the load cases, the self-weight, the form traveler, the weight of the fresh concrete, everything here. And you can just pick one of them, like for example, the form traveler, and this is going to separate or distinguish this load from the dead load case that is shown in here. So that, that's really a, a very powerful thing that you can look at this load only by itself, or you can look at the summation of all dead loads or loads applied on the structure. Uh, of course, the pre-stressing effect will be displayed uh, by itself in a separate case, and the creep and shrinkage effects uh, can be displayed independently. And if you choose summation, this is gonna give you everything. So let's say, for example, for dead load only, and the moment in the basic axis here, MY, and then you go and display the value for this, you wanna make sure that you are using the correct um, uh, unit and this is what you expect from the dead load effect it's going to be a negative moment because of the cantilever uh, action on the structure and you see the moment is uh, 1045 this is displayed for step number one remember we had a step at number one and another step that is seven days after the first step seven days is when the weight of the fresh concrete that is casted here at the ends of the bridge kicks in so if you display that last step, you see the moment now jumped from 1045 to, two, uh, to 2300. So this includes now the moment generated coming from the weight of the fresh concrete. But all those loads at the end are coming from the dead load. Only. If you wanna see the uh, pre-stressing effect, the pre-stressing effect is of course going to counteract the dead load effect on the structure. So you can see the placement of the tendons at the top created a, a positive moment, if you want to call it this way, or a moment that's against the cantilever moment of the structure, and that's how it's distributed. This moment from the pre-stressing effect varies from step to the other based on the losses, because it takes into account the days and the losses that happens over the days. If you want to display the creep effect only by itself, you can just pick creep and just show the moments that are coming due to creep. and Something that is really very legitimate is when you look at the creep at the first stage or first step, you don't have any creep on the structure because it has not yet developed. But when you go to the last stage, this is when it comes and kicks in into display. And you can use this same uh, configuration to display all moments that you want to see 
over the stages. So going to stage number two, going to stage number three, and how the moment varies on the structure. You see the dead load effect is increasing with the stages and make sure that what step are you choosing? The last step is the one that includes the weight of the fresh concrete that's casted at the ends of the cantilever. So it is the one that gives you the maximum moment in here. So this is if we want to display the moment shape, you can do the same thing to display the force on the structure, the axial force effect. And you can expect very small or minimum axial forces from dead loads, but the tendon effect, or the pre-stressing effect puts compression on the structure. So you see the compression is building up all the way to the end of the pier. And that makes sense because the pre-stressing is curtailment or there is some curtailment that's happening on the tendons. Tendons are more here and less here. So that's what you expect as well. I talked earlier about displaying stresses. This is something that if you are interested in, you can always go to stresses and see beam stresses here and basically look at the stresses generated, let's say from dead load. And let's pick, for example, the bottom fiber of the girder. And we wanna display the stresses due to that and make sure uh, that you are picking this on the right uh, unit, ton meter or ton millimeter or whatever the unit that you are looking at. And this is going to, to give you the stress number. So you expect to have compression stress at the bottom from dead loads because dead loads, this is a cantilever. So it's generating compression at the bottom and tension at the top. If I switch to the other fiber, I'm gonna see a positive number here because it's tension. If I go to the pre-stressing effect, it should be the opposite of the uh, cantilever effect. So at the top, the pre-stressing is generating compression and this is coming from the moment uh, compression side from the tendon, but at the bottom, it is <clears throat> generating some tension because the tension side of the uh, of the moment is uh, at the bottom. Nice features here about the results for this uh, frequent lever is you can also look at the stress as in the form of a diagram. If you choose the bridge girder diagram option here, you can see the stress diagram and you can pick, for example, to see the stress on a particular element or a particular segment, or you can even choose the group that has all the bridge elements together. So we can display it on the entire elements that are active inside this particular stage. And let's say, for example, we are looking at stage number five on all the elements that are applicable in this stage on the last step due to dead load, for example, and we are looking at the bottom fiber stresses and we hit apply. This generates automatically on those uh, elements, what is the stress? And you can see the stress is in compression because we are talking about the dead load and uh, those five elements. If you choose to change this to pre-stressing or tendon effect in stress and then hit apply, it's going to show you uh, that effect from pre-stressing only. I think I'm just did, um, yeah, this needs to be bridge girder. So this gives you the stress coming from the pre-stressing effect only by itself. And you see it's tension at the bottom fiber from the pre-stressing effect by itself. If you wanna see the summation, not from a particular load case, you wanna see the summation on the structure, like the pre-stressing combined with the dead load and the creep and everything, you just hit apply here. It's gonna give you the resultant stress that's acting on the segment. And that's very important actually, because this is the one that you are checking against your allowable stresses and you see it's in compression at the bottom fiber and this is not uh, a surprise because the compression source is coming from the pre-stressing tendon effect the axial compression force from the pre-stressing and the compression coming from the dead load effect both are hitting on compression on the bottom fiber and it's only some tension coming from the pre-stressing effect that's counteracted by those two components so this is the stress diagram the other thing, I know that time is killing us, but the other thing that we can look at very quickly is, and it's of interest to many people, is the cantilever, uh, maybe the camber. And the camber control table is what I consider really powerful about this software. So um, So if we choose, for example, to display the camber on the entire structure and 
the real displacement. This is the graph view, this is the table view. I think I, I wanted to look at the table view. Yeah, this is generated here on those uh, elements, I think only, on those nodes only, but uh, we can, there is one. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, it just happens that sometimes you uh, struggle to get uh, into the, the same window that you, let's say, for example, we are looking into all the stages all together and we choose to show okay so that is something that uh, i just need to uh, to refresh my mind on but there is there is a big table that you can basically uh, display the camber on the entire structure all the structure together in all stages and it's going to give you the values for the camber and you want to make sure that you pick the correct unit here Let's say, for example, campers can be read in very minimal units, like millimeters or something. So it's going to show you at every node what is the camber value at this particular stage. And this is something that is uh, very important to monitor during the construction because you want to make sure that you end up with a displaced uh, shape for the structure that matches the expectation uh, during construction and does not exceed limits. And also when you erect the closure segments, especially the closure segments at the end, you want to make sure that you have the two tips in front of each other and controlled by somehow that you don't end up with big variations uh, between the levels of the ends of the tips uh, of the cantilever. So I think this, uh, this is just a quick presentation of, of this um, segmental uh, construction on the bridge just one quick thing that um, i'm just gonna take me exactly five minutes is this time dependent material definition that i wanted to go over it very quickly so basically time dependent definition is uh, nice and powerful inside midas here because you can pick the code that you are using for this definition and i have used in the past the fib many times it's it's one of the uh, reliable codes when it comes to the time dependent definition and Basically, what you need to uh, define here is the characteristic compressive strength, 28 days strength for the concrete, and what you are using for the relative humidity, what percentage that you are using. And this is the most important definition, is the notional size of the member. And this comes from a, a formula here that divides the section area over the perimeter that's in contact with the atmosphere. So this gives you the notional size of the member and what type of cement that you are using for the construction. And this uh, differs based on the conditions and the uh, weather uh, at the location of the site and what type of cement that you are using and what age you can consider the concrete can start shrinking it. And this basically gives you what all the definitions that are needed to um, define the creep and the shrinkage effects on the structure. And the reason why we have two definitions here, because each concrete will have different parameters and will have a different creep model. The other definition that you need also to define is the how the concrete gains strength over time, since it's casted all the way up to the 28 days. So this is a chart here that shows you the relation between the day and the uh, uh, amount of strength that is added. And basically, this is calculated also based on the code that you pick or you select. So we are using the same code to stay consistent on the two uh, properties. And that's the equation that's used here. It's an exponential equation that takes time into uh, consideration and the characteristic strength as well into consideration. And it draws you uh, this uh, nice curve that represents how the concrete gains strength over time. And what's the type of cement that is used here? So those curves are being used during the construction stages because remember we defined everything in the stages with time definition and durations. So those times it's going to calculate automatically what's going to be the strength and the properties of the concrete at that time. And that makes a difference when it comes to creep and shrinkage effects on the bridge. Uh, the last thing is now we defined for, for example, for the 400 uh, megapascal concrete, we defined 
the creep and shrinkage model and we define the uh, gain, the strength gain over time. So we want to associate those two properties with the material. So there is another link here or a window here that can enable you to do this. Not sure why it's not coming up, maybe because we need to uh, just remove the run and go back to the base stage. Usually when you make any definitions or want to see any properties, you want to make sure that you unlock the file and you go back to the base stage. And this is basically the uh, uh, linking that I was talking about, that you want to choose the material and say, yes, this material, the 400 uh, megapascal material is associated with the creep and shrinkage property for the 400 one and the compressive strength gain for the 400. So you associate those two properties to that particular material. And when you do that, you are uh, you have concluded the definition for the time dependent properties, which shows up automatically after that in the construction stage. At this point, I think I'm, I covered this uh, bridge and this model here for the segmental construction. Um, so, uh, so Luciana, we are now to 11. Okay, um, yeah, we have like uh, one or two questions. Um, let me just put them together so I can put them on the screen. Yes. Uh, give me one second. Um, in the meantime, hold on. Uh, in the meantime, if you guys who are still, we still have a lot of people here. <laughs> um, for those of you who are still here, if you don't mind just taking this quick survey, um, it should only take about like a second or so. And once you guys are done, I'll pull up the questions really quick. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the questions. We only have a few right now. Your presentation was very thorough. <laughs> um, okay. Show my screen. Okay. So the first question we have is, can results be enveloped such that concurrent reactions for a particular enveloped case can be outputted? For example, max moment and concurrent shear. Yeah, I think this uh, comes from uh, this definition here um, about the analysis options. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the thing that happens every time when I get into this, that there are too many windows, sometimes you forget where you get it from, but there was one window, yeah, you can say calculate concurrent forces of frame, so you want to make sure that this is checked, and uh, this way when you present it later on in the, uh, in the results, you can always see the results in the form of tables, so it gives you like the maximum and minimum moment on a particular frame, and what are the corresponding six, five actions, the two shears, the axial force, and the other two moments on, uh, on the frame, and I think this, this even happens when you right click on the table and hit something called max and min. I remember this one. It gives you the uh, concurrent effect, like display all the cases concurrent to each other. So um, that, is, that is how you uh, get to those, uh, to those results. Okay, and then the last question we have um, for now is after being shown the wizard tool in the GUI for building the geometry of the balanced cantilever structure, I had a question on if there's a dynamic editing function similar to the interactive database editing functionality provided in CSI Bridge, or to make the changes, would uh, would you have to re-edit the wizard tool slash use the GUI exclusively? 
Um, having an external access allows calculations outputs to be form formatted to be to the inputs of the program so the changes to uh, to the model can be made more automatic automated throughout the design and variations. Yeah, I actually appreciate this question very much because <laughs> I have worked with CSI Bridge before. I know this interactive database editing that enables you to define all parameters from Excel for the bridge, including geometry, section definitions, loads and uh, nodes and everything. And it helps you when you deal with this uh, such complicated models when you have a huge amount of data that needs to be inputted. And uh, I totally get this. And um, I think here, uh, this is a question that we can also share input from uh, Midas group about it, because I know that you guys have uh, um, like a text format uh, that you can always define structures using text uh, or a programming tool, something. Um, I just want to remember the this uh, MCT command shell. Uh, I believe this is the one that uh, you can input or insert commands and data, and this enables you to make changes in the model without using the graphical uh, user interface thing. Uh, honestly, I have not discovered this much uh, to the moment, but I know that this has been implemented in Midas for years now, and I know people that, uh, very few people also, they, they know how uh, to deal with it and uh, use it, but that's that's uh, my understanding, but uh, Midas team, of course, you can weigh in on this. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, Angela, who's with us, can definitely chime in. Amir, were you, um, were you showing something on your screen, by the way? Just because yes, yes. I'm, I'm sharing my screen right now, so the yeah, audience I, probably I, didn't see it. Hold on. Yeah, I'm showing the command shell. I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so Nicholas, about your question about this, I know that here inside tools, this uh, command shell tool enables you to define all the geometry, the loads, boundary conditions for the model using the text uh, um, tool. And you can always uh, insert commands. You see, it has a big library for every single definition that you do inside the model. And you can insert commands, for example, a command for a node or something, you are able to insert it here. And then you can play with the coordinates with numbers, uh, define numbers for those pieces in, and that's how you define a node. And you can repeat this as much as you need to uh, and move to other commands. So that's the tool that's typically used for defining the the models outside the graphical user interface. And uh, when you keep this file later on, you are able always to change it and do parametric changes as needed. Uh, about the interactive database editing, that's the, um, what the competitors do, I would say, in uh, CSI Bridge when they use this. And uh, it enables you to open everything in Excel and define the whole thing in Excel uh, for nodes, loads, everything. Uh, but the same, uh, concept is also provided in Midas. And uh, uh, Luciana, Angela, you can weigh in if you want to emphasize more on this uh, tool. Yes, yes, Amir, that's right. And also uh, Nicholas, who asked a question. Um, yeah, in Midas, uh, basically, once you create a model using the wizard, the model is no longer associated with the wizard. So that model is just like a group of finite elements and associated like boundary conditions, loadings, you know, it, it doesn't really, it's not associated with the wizard or the template anymore. Therefore, whatever that you produced using the wizard, they're just like completely yours to maybe just to change the section or maybe move one or more links or change the value of the load, you know, you're like, Yes, you could like redo the wizard, but uh, you know you can literally just go into the load data under the workstream menu, uh, find the specific loading that you want to modify, and you know increase the value or decrease the value or delete it. You know, um, regarding your second question, um, how about you know having an external access that allows calculation outputs to be formatted? Uh, to the inputs of the program, so changes to the model can be made more automated throughout design iterations. So I guess it's basically about like, you know, can Midas, you know, can Midas's design output can be automatically taken as like the input to it so that, you know, the software can literally iterate the design and give you the most optimal options. 
uh, we do that for, for example, like regular steel sections, like, you know, like, you know, like cross frames or I beams or, you know, angle sections, you know, those like AISC, you know, like the standard steel sections. Yes, uh, we do offer iterations within the software. However, for more customized, you know, like bridge sections, um, you know, like plate uh, girders, like pre-stressed concrete box girders, you know, like you kind of have to, We right now we don't iterate it for you, but rather it's going to give you like the checking result and this is the, the, the primary, one of the primary benefit of using MyDSL. Once you actually do the design checking though, uh, it's going to give you like pages of Excel reports uh, about each of the location you want to review close up, you know? So it's going to give you all the formula, all the, you know, code clauses, all the explanations, all the values, uh, put into like really nicely formatted Excel report, you know, uh, for design. However, for those custom bridge sections, uh, we don't iterate the section for you, at least right now. So your best option is to review the summary table and then detail table, and then maybe like detail Excel report for the specific critical points you wanna review, uh, get a clue, you know, why your section might be failing or how the design needs to be, you know, modified, go back to the modeling. And like I said earlier, the model once generated using the wizard is no longer associated with the wizard. So you can manually like change or update the section or anything you need. Uh, but that's right now. Uh, we're actually in the process of uh, adding like API, uh, the application like plugin uh, like interfaces with Midas, meaning uh, we are going to allow such external access. Um, but yeah, like there will be like toward the end of this year, uh, the scope of those API, like external access will not be like 100% of what we are aiming for at this time, at the time. But yeah, like, like we're going to have it initially uh, toward the end of next year. And from that point on, we will continue to extend um, the range of, you know, how, how extensively and uh, this API can be used uh, so that, you know, as one of the ways to utilize it, you know, so that all, all of our clients can automate their design process. Um, but yeah, I, I hope I answer your question, Nicholas. Okay, thank you guys. Um, I think that, yeah, basically sums up a lot of our questions. Um, the rest is just everybody thanking you, Amir, for your great session. <laughs> um, everybody who found it very, very helpful. Um, but yeah, I think unless uh, anybody else has any more questions, that concludes our session for today. Um, we did go a little over, but I think it was very well worth it. Amir, thank you so much for this amazing session. I know with the holidays coming up, it was it was definitely, we were very grateful for you um, to have, have put time aside for us. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I know our audience really enjoyed this session. Um, I'll be putting up the recording later on. Uh, either today or early next week. But yeah, thank you again, Amir, so much for, for this great session. You are welcome, Luciana. Thank you so much. And Angela and uh, my team, we really like enjoying those sessions and sharing uh, experiences. That, that's great. Thank you. Absolutely. Amir, thank you so, thank much. You so much. We really appreciate it. Happy wow. holidays. You are welcome. Happy holidays for all. Thank you, guys. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.